Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on how to scale agroecology. I am sure that this will be an exciting journey for all of us, and especially with such a distinguished lineup of speakers and panelists. My name is Blessings Flau, and I am Access Agriculture Coordinator for Malawi and Southern Africa. I am greatly honored to moderate this session. Before we start, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items so that you know how best to participate in today's event. Please note that this session is being recorded and to all of our speakers and panelists, please remember to put your mic on and on mute and turn off your cameras when you are not presenting. For all participants, if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box and these will be addressed during the Q&A segment. Furthermore, please use the chat area for comments and to let us know who you are, your organization, and where you are joining us from. If you are following on Facebook, please note that you can post comments and questions there and we'll be able to incorporate them into the discussion as we go along. And finally, please note that we have interpretation into French and Spanish available. Today's webinar is especially organized to mark the 10th anniversary of Access Agriculture and is jointly organized by Access Agriculture and Agroecology Coalition. The webinar's theme is particularly important to both of these organizations. Access Agriculture promotes agroecology and rural entrepreneurship through capacity development and south to south exchange of quality farmer to farmer training videos in local languages. The Agroecology Coalition vision envisages an inclusive food system based on the principles of agroecology. The coalition already has about 115 members, that's including countries and organizations that are committed to making agroecological transitions a widespread reality. Without further delay, I would like to share the objective of today's event, and that is to celebrate the achievements of Access Agriculture in the last 10 years and help shape its future strategy as a global service provider and scaling agent to help mainstream agroecology and transition towards more resilient food systems. And our first speaker today is Emil Frisson, who is a leading expert on agriculture biodiversity and sustainable food systems. Emil is also the interim coordinator of Agroecology Coalition and member of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, or IPES in short. He is the lead author of the IPES Food Report, From Uniformity to Diversity, a Paradigm Shift from Industrial Agriculture to Diversified Agroecological <coughs> Systems. His presentation today will focus on strategies to amplify agroecology, influencing mindsets, and policy. Please join me in welcoming Emil. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction. I <clears throat> am very pleased to participate uh, in this webinar and I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate Access Agriculture for the tremendous work it has been doing over the last 10 years and <clears throat> especially the contribution it's making today uh, to uh, the Agroecology Coalition. So, <clears throat> I will be uh, <clears throat> talking to you about agroecology. Uh, first of all, a, a reminder about why uh, we need to address our food systems uh, that are not sustainable because they produce about one third of greenhouse gases. They are responsible for 80% of biodiversity losses. They pollute soil, air, and water. They are vulnerable to climate change. They do not address the trip. Yeah, yeah and lost video. I think we have lost Emil. Um, Dr. Emil, are you with us? I think go to Joe. Yeah? 
All right, then um, we'll wait for him to come back up. In the meantime, we'll be proceeding. <coughs> Dr. Emil, are you with us? Blessings, over to you. All right, we will get back to, to Dr. Emil's presentation once we have him back up. In the meantime, I'd like to introduce Josephine Rogers, who is the Executive Director and Co-Founder of Access Agriculture. Joe has created award-winning multi-language interactive training packages on agriculture, food, and rural development, and has played a crucial role in building local video production capacities on her 40 years of experience. Today, she will speak about scaling agroecology with quality training videos and ICT tools. Joe, over to you. Thank you very much, blessings. And uh, good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. <clears throat> Scaling agroecology with quality training videos and ICT tools. That's a challenge on three fronts. First, the, the challenge of helping people understand that agroecology can be a way of producing food that's both sustainable and profitable. Second, the challenge of producing quality training videos, because what is quality? And third, distributing this knowledge, because digital connectivity is a major challenge still in many countries, particularly away from capital cities. And also data can be very expensive in a lot of countries still as well. So first, the challenge that ecological knowledge uh, is complex and that makes it difficult to share and to explain. And there is so much knowledge that does need to be shared. Face to face extension is an additional challenge. Extension services are often underfunded and frequently both women and youth are marginalized in the process. So let's take a look at some of the topics that videos on access agriculture have covered and the comments from people who have contributed. First, seed and biodiversity. It's so important to maintain varieties that can provide options in the face of climate change. As Dominica here from Peru says, we conserve the varieties from our ancestors so they are not lost. We have to keep conserving them to feed ourselves and our children who come after us. Reviving soil health. <clears throat> the health of soil is crucial in agroecology. And there are many videos on the website that use waste products to help revive soil health and bring earthworms back in abundance. Jaya Lalitha from India says they use only plastic containers as the metal ones can interfere with the good microbes and spoil fermentation. And if they use clay pots, solution will leak out through the pores and attract ants and insects. Intercropping can bring many benefits and you can see on the bottom, there are many videos that feature this. Vincent from Uganda points out that another benefit is that the worms that bring fertility in the soil do not die of hot weather conditions as they stay in a cool environment, just like he does. Animal health, <clears throat> let's not forget that there are many videos that cover how to keep livestock healthy. And we'll be hearing later from someone who's been involved in both producing and using those videos. Kalavati from India knows that when the chickens have internal worms, she can help to prevent this by giving chickens the extract of boiled peel of pomegranates. So using very simple natural remedies. One final example of real importance in scaling agroecology is uh, local food systems and governance. The importance of local and regional markets can't be overstated. This is where the bulk of smallholder farmers will sell into. And it's also important for consumers to understand the provenance of their food. Jane here from Kenya started drying kale leaves uh, because all the farmers were, were planting kale. And with excess supply on the market, the price drops. And some of the kale was then end up, ended up being thrown away. Farmers need to have options to be able to, to process their crops so they can sell at other times of the year. So that gives you an idea of some of the wide range of topics. Now let's move on to creating quality training videos. What do we mean by quality? And as I've often asked, 
what content? How do we decide the actual subject of each video? Well, the simple answer to that is we don't. We work with local partners, people who have their feet on the ground, working with communities day in and day out. There are many stages in video production. To create a quality video doesn't just happen. And all these stages are important, but the very first stage of good research with communities to, to co-create content can't be overstated. So from research, fact sheets to scripts, all the time checking back with communities, referencing subject matter experts to make sure the videos are as regionally and worldwide relevant as possible. And on average, 70% of production time is actually spent at this stage. Once a good script has, has been created, the next stage is, is filming with lots of great detailed images to really show what is being talked about. And interviews are an essential part of the videos, listening to people in their own words, describing what, how and why they do things. Hearing from your own peer group is immensely powerful to inspire people that they too can try something new or make changes in what they are doing. Once filming has been done, the videos are edited. <clears throat> we don't have lots of talking heads in Access Agriculture videos, but rather many great images to illustrate what the video is really about. But this first edit then needs to be shown to an audience to get their reaction, as this will guide us to improving the video further so that the information is clearly conveyed in the final edit. And then, of course, we, we are talking about translations. As with video production, this doesn't just happen. Translating scripts and voicing them so that the length of the video remains the same is a real skill. And we continue to train and upskill people to be able to do this work to the standard required. Since 2012, we have run video production courses, fact sheet, script and scripting writing courses, translation courses in many countries. And even during COVID, we have guided translations and video production remotely. By producing one quality video on a subject, it avoids having to film the same subject over and over again. As a result, over these last 10 years, the number of actual videos have increased year on year here, little blue, blue lines on them. As mentioned before, uh, this is not a quick process, but the need is definitely pressing. With local languages, we now have nearly 100, giving over 3000 videos available on the Access Agriculture platform. But there is much work to do. So on to the third challenge I mentioned at the start, distributing this knowledge. We have what we call an ecosystem of digital tools, starting with the two platforms we have, Access Agriculture and EcoAgTube. On the Access Agriculture platform, you see here on the left, there are 14 main categories, each with a number of subcategories, covering many topics, which I touched briefly on earlier. The platform itself is in six languages, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Hindi, and Bangla. The video languages are found in a separate list and by selecting a language you will see how many and which videos are in that language. By registering on the site you can download video and audio tracks as well as really important a fact sheet for each video. EcoAgTube is in effect our own social media platform where people can upload their own videos. You can have your own channel or better still for projects, you can be in control of the videos that get uploaded. And of course, you can get viewing analytics. Many organizations have found better viewing figures on EcoAgTube than on YouTube because they're not all the other distractions. And videos that are already on YouTube and Vimeo can just be brought across without having to, to upload again. An Access Agriculture app, uh, this will be available shortly. Uh, given the number of videos and the languages, this certainly hasn't been a simple process to, to do, but it is coming very soon. 
One last example we can see here is a solar powered smart projector in action in India. And yes, it is that little white square thing in the center of the picture. Notice that the audience are watching a video that was produced in West Africa, but they're listening to it in their own language. Does a farmer in one continent recognize a farmer in another? Well, the answer is simply yes, they cert most certainly do. And although soil and climate are different, farmers know that. They watch the videos, they get new ideas, they discuss, and then they try out things in themselves or in groups. And seeing how others have overcome a problem, it can be a real eye opener and very empowering. So in summary, creating quality training videos that can be translated takes time, but such videos allow farmers to understand and then take their own decisions. By using local languages, we can cross barriers and reach those who are hardest to reach with knowledge that can change lives and livelihoods. And finally, no single technology will scale agroecology. We need this ecosystem of digital tools with quality content to explain and to inspire. So many thanks for listening. Uh, you'll be hearing much more about how these resources are being used in practice and which I'm sure you'll find as inspiring as I do. And now I hand back to blessings. Thank you very much, Josephine, for giving us insights on how Access Agriculture is putting the power of learning in farmers' hands through these quality training videos on agroecology. Technology didn't quite allow us to go through with uh, Emil's presentation. And Emil, if you're back with us, I'd like you to take us through your presentation. Thank you very much, and I apologize for my uh, internet interruption. So uh, I'll take it from where uh, I left it, uh, talking about what's wrong with our current systems and the fact that uh, these are all associated directly with our current food system based on industrial agriculture. <clears throat> the fact that we need transformational change has been well recognized already since 2016 in the first report that was mentioned by Blessings uh, produced by Pest Food, but many major international reports since that have been highlighting the need for substantial transformational change in our food systems, and they all highlight the role that agroecology can play in uh, making these uh, transformations possible. So what we really uh, need is is really to move forward and uh, have a change in the in paradigm. It's not just about uh, adjusting and improving the current systems. We really need to rethink profoundly uh, uh, and envisage a different paradigm that we call diversified agroecological systems. These are systems that address economic, environmental, climate mitigation and adaptation health, social, and cultural objectives simultaneously. They are based on addressing 13 principles of agroecology that have been developed by the high-level panel of experts of the Committee on World Food Security in 2019. And these are aligned with the 10 elements of agroecology that are adopted by 196 countries and FAO. These principles are about addressing uh, different uh, type of objectives, strengthening resilience of our systems, improving the resource efficiency, but also it is also about uh, uh, securing social equity, about fairness, about connectivity, about participation. So, <clears throat> That different paradigm is not just about a set of agricultural practices. It addresses the entire food system from production to consumption. It takes all the best of all innovations that are compatible with the 13 principles of agroecology. Uh, 
and combine it with traditional and farmer knowledge. So it's not a top-down uh, technology-driven approach, but rather a participatory uh, approach, mixing and marrying a traditional farmer knowledge with the best of modern science. It's also about changing social relations, empowering farmers, adding <clears throat> value locally, privileging short value chains that link consumers to producers. It's a holistic, integrated approach to reach these different objectives simultaneously. And it aims to achieve the sustainable development goals in an integrated manner. So this transformational change, as I said, it's not just about changing production practices. It requires changes in knowledge generation and transmission, changes in social and economic relations, changes in institutional frameworks. And all of that taking as objectives the 13 uh, principles of agroecology. And this is not a, uh, a list to pick from, but they have to be approached all 13 simultaneously to be effective. And that's the strength of agroecology, is that it's, it's doing these, uh, addressing these multi, multiple objectives simultaneously. So there are already multiple examples of agroecology at scale. Uh, I just listed a few here, uh, just uh, as an illustration. Uh, but now agroecology is being practiced throughout the globe on all continents in many countries. Many countries also are adopting national policies that are supporting agroecology. Uh, different departments on agroecology are being created. Uh, and we see, especially in the last two years and maybe even more in the last one year, with the different crises we've gone through, uh, with the uh, COVID, the impact that the COVID crisis had on our food systems, and now the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the impact that has on fertilizer availability and prices and uh, commodity uh, prices and availability we are seeing that it's more urgent than ever to have this transformation uh, done. And that is more and more recognized by a large number of countries. So just to conclude a few words about the coalition. This is a coalition of the willing. Today we have 39 countries or rather 36 countries plus the African Union Commission, the uh, ECOWAS Commission and the European Commission, plus 77 organizations that are all joining forces to uh, accelerate the agroecological transformation that is uh, badly needed. It's operating today through five working groups, one on policy, one on research and innovation, one on financing and investment, one on communication and advocacy, and this working group is particularly important because uh, we know that we need to have this mindset change and the role that uh, Access Agriculture is playing in this working group uh, is particularly important. And finally, uh, the fifth working group on implementation of uh, agroecological initiatives on the ground. So these working groups are up and running we still have new uh, members joining the coalition almost every week. Uh, there is a tremendous uh, uh, dynamism behind this uh, coalition. And we really think that it can play a very important role in addressing uh, the uh, problems that we are encountering with our food systems today. So uh, I thank you. Uh, for attending the, this webinar. I thank Access Agriculture for inviting me and I'm very pleased that uh, Agroecology Coalition is been a co-organizer of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emil, for a very enlightening presentation, which I think with Josephine's presentation sets the stage for today's webinar. Before we move on to our next speaker, I would like to remind everyone of these two things. Firstly, we have interpretation available in French and Spanish, and there are instructions being put in the chat. 
And if you're also just joining us, please remember to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know um, what organization you are affiliated with and where you are connecting from. Our next speaker is Paul Van Melly, who is Director, International Development at Access Agriculture. Paul has spearheaded the model of South to South learning through farmer to farmer training videos in local languages for over 20 years. He has played a leadership role in building local capacities to scale the model of producing new video content based on community needs with a wide regional relevance in support of food security. The theme for his presentation today is partnerships and youth entrepreneurs to scale agroecology. Paul, over to you. Thank you very much, Blessings. And uh, I'd like to build on what the previous speakers have been talking about. Um, about communication, it is important that we look at partnerships, but also for building sustainable food systems for the future. We have to consider how we can bring in youth in helping to scale agroecology and also being an active uh, player in it. Now, Emil mentioned already that it is important to not just focus on production, but to look at the whole range of aspects that relate to the food environment. So also social movements are important, how to bring in the state, so the policies are important, but also how to influence consumers because how people decide what to eat also has a big impact on what farmers produce and how they produce it. Obviously the science is there to, to back um, innovations, but also the private sector has a role to play. As Josephine mentioned, our focus with Access Agriculture has been to create an environment for co-learning among multiple food system actors. And although our videos are geared towards training farmers, it is important to realize that many other stakeholders are making use of the videos including extension services, education institutes, organic input suppliers, research and geo CSOs, farmer organizations, and also media. And this, I think, is really important because we are not just talking about building capacities, but changing mindsets and changing relations within, within the food system. And I just want to share this uh, one slide with you on strategic partnerships that we have established. On the top line, you can see some of the international organizations and networks with whom we have been interacting a lot. The bottom lines are all, these are all examples from India, but I just wanted to highlight that, okay, there's um, interaction with a, a private company, there's interactions with, with universities that focus on, on herbal medicine. There's NGOs. There's also mass media involved. Now, one of the things that Access Agriculture has been developing over the past four years is to bring in youth in helping to bring the videos to farmers, to the communities, and to do this not just as a, as a voluntary thing, but as a, as a profession. And so we call these young people the entrepreneurs for rural access. They make use of the smart projector, which Josephine already showed in her presentation. So they actually can screen videos to rural communities without being connected to the internet, even without having access to electricity. Now, how do we go about setting up such, such a network of entrepreneurs for rural access? Well, first of all, as Joe also mentioned, it is important for the audience to be able to watch videos, irrespective of the country in which they were produced, but to listen and to watch to the videos in their own language. So for an entrepreneur, to be able to make a business, it is important to have at least 
100 videos translated into the local language. The ICT tool already showed it. Smart projector is very important. We then organize competitions, online competitions, through what we call the Young Entrepreneur Challenge Fund. And this is a mechanism that we use to identify entrepreneurs. Often these young people are already active in the green economy and they want to broaden the services that they bring within, within the food system. We do coach these young people then over a period of 18 months to become professional extension service providers. Joe mentioned that we have this vast range of topics, videos on soil health, on animal health, on food processing, whatnot. And it is important, I think, um, to give farmers the opportunity. And it is this richness that allows farmers to decide what to watch. And so these young entrepreneurs, they are actually trained also to bring a service based upon demand and not just come with a, with a prefixed agenda. Many, and for the moment, I think we have, we have over 200 young people across, I think, 10 African countries and India who run this model, this business. And most of them combine their advisory services with other businesses. In Egypt, for instance, one of the entrepreneurs is actually selling biogas installations. Uh, in other places, they are involved in food processing or selling seed. But also animal fodder is, is really important. And some of these young entrepreneurs, they have actually picked ideas from the videos, decided, hey, I can run a business of producing these inputs, these organic inputs for farmers, and at the same time promote it by showing videos, by establishing a relation of trust with the rural communities. And interestingly, these young entrepreneurs, they earn between 40 and 100 dollars per month from organizing video screenings from renting the smart projector to organizations some are running workshops even setting up their own organic farms and using that at the same time to experiment with things that they have been showing uh, to, to rural communities and some even sell individual videos because farmers are really eager to get the videos into their own hands and be able to watch them over and over again because the content is so inspiring and so rich. Now, another source of revenue, indirect revenues we could call it, is that through the video screening service, some of the entrepreneurs have also enhanced the sales of their core business by 40% through product awareness. Now, for instance, they're selling more honey or mushrooms or hydroponic fodder. The bottom you can see the range of, of entrepreneurs. Some are going into the village with a bicycle, some, some with a motorbike. So this is all up to also the creativity of these young people. Now in terms of outreach, and as we, this, this whole workshop is about scaling, um, we are celebrating our 10th anniversary and we are really proud that we have already served over 5,000 organizations with our digital platform and digital tools. That includes extension services, farmer organizations, so mass media houses. And through this range of partners, but also people who are not, or organizations that are not strictly um, a former partner, we have been able to reach over 90 million people. And I'm just going to give a few statistics. Um, you can see the video platform visitors. It has increased tremendously from when we started uh, 60,000, 10 years ago. Last year, we had nearly 350,000 visitors in, in, in a single year. Um, the users, roughly 42% were women. More than 50% are younger than 34 years. So this shows also how digital content is really attractive 
to youth. More interestingly even, this model of youth being entrepreneurs, bringing extension services, it actually allows us to even reach more women. 56% of the audience that these young people reach are women. And more than 66% um, are actually younger than 35 years old. So youth bringing services attracts also youth in the audience and inspires you to start um, playing a role in, in agroecology. The appreciation of local knowledge, I think this is also a key, key dimension for, for agroecology. Um, the other one, seeking more information, this I think is a, is a true impact measure of, of empowerment and the involvement of youth um, amongst others. Now, just to conclude, by, these are some lessons that we've learned over the past decade. By investing in quality training videos for farmers, you really can reach and influence many stakeholders in the food system. And Claire will talk about that in a minute. Appropriate ICT tools combined with local social capital can help to engage more rural women and youth in agroecological transitioning. We know that youth lack land, they don't have money, they also lack knowledge, but they are really interested in providing services, in producing organic inputs and niche commodities, in food processing and in local marketing. And we believe that with our digital tools, we actually have a really powerful opportunity to bring these youth into what we are currently trying to achieve and that is transitioning towards more sustainable food systems. So with this, I would like to thank everybody for their attention and I will hand over back to Blessings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for a wonderful presentation on how Access Agriculture's model of last mile delivery through young change makers is helping to scale agroecology. Now I would like us to welcome our next speaker, Claire Nicklin, who is the Andes Regional Representative for Collaborative Crop Research Program at McKnight Foundation. Claire is based in Quito, Ecuador, and supports the Andes grantees in Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. She also contributes to program-wide monitoring and evaluation. Her interests include utilization-focused evaluation, short-circuit markets, agrobiodiversity conservation, and mixed methods. Claire will speak today on farmer-to-farmer -farmer videos in a collaborative research network. Welcome, Claire, and over to you. Thank you, Blessings. Hello, everyone. Um, great. Thank you. Yes, I work with the Collaborative Crop Research Program, CCRP of the McKnight Foundation. And Paul asked me to talk about farmer to farmer videos and collaborative research networks and our work with Access Agriculture over the last few years. Um, next, please. We work in three communities of practice, two in Africa and the Andes, where I work, um, as well as being based in Minnesota and working in Minnesota. In the Andes, we have a portfolio of around 18 projects. We usually fund for about three years, uh, $300,000, and but fund many phases and are, are often a, a long-term partner with our with our projects. And now, um, uh, that's so I'm talking about where we work, and now I'll talk about how we work. Um, <laughs> simply, we do agroecological. We fund agroecological research for action, and how we do it is often participatory, or that's our intention, um, collaborative, multi-sector, and transdisciplinary. Next, please. So about six years ago, we approached um, Access Agriculture in Latin America to help us in, um, you know, we think about research, but a big part of research is also communicating and learning through the communication and doing that for various um, audiences like Next, please. <clears throat> um, a research audience, so we support our projects in doing peer-reviewed journal articles. Um, many of our grantees are NGOs, 
farm organizations as well as research organizations. Also, there's this kind of practitioner or technician or facilitator audience. Um, so a lot of projects, you know, as we know, publish gray literature. Um, consumers and lay public, that's another really important um, uh, audience when we talk about agroecology and, and, and food system transformation. So projects have worked with radio, social media, media. Next, please. Decision makers, things like policy, pardon, sorry, things like um, policy briefs, and then for farmers, we've really been impressed with the evidence of, of access agriculture and others on videos as being really effective with farmers. Next, please. Um, so we've gotten into a into a pattern of asking every project for every project phase every three years or so to please do a video along with maybe an article or a gray literature. But this is an important audience. Next, sorry, I'm not in control of my. And it starts, I really like the access agriculture method that others have, have touched on. This is from 2018 in Bolivia, a script writing workshop I went to. And in the picture on the left, you can see project personnel, again, mostly NGO folks, getting together and, and learning how to write and think and learn together. Um, and then on the, on the right, they always have these script writing workshops in a farmer community. And there's a constant, and I like it because it's not tokenism of having the farmer always at in the, in a room in the table, but going out to the field, reading the script, which can be a very humbling experience to to realize how much jargon we use and, and how you know how we're communicating ideas. So I really like the method. Next, and then they come back usually a few months later, and they film. And the way they film, which I really like, is only farmer and and Joe kind of touching this is only farmer testimonies. You can't have a technician or a technico like we say in Spanish be there and talking or a researcher talking about how great something is. So I always say it's like farmer peer review. If a farmer's not using it and doesn't believe in it, you can't just make a video about it. So I really like that about, it's been very effective. Next, please. We've also, as has been mentioned before, translated hundreds of access agriculture videos into dozens of languages and projects continue to use that. And, and that's been a very effective method. Next. So we often talk about scaling deep out and up. And in terms of scaling deep, I found Access Agriculture, these videos making them has been very um, powerful. And when I say scaling deep, it's you know kind of changing hearts and minds of an individual. Paul asked me to talk about how have the videos changed the dynamics of interaction between researchers and farmers. Next, and my, and my response was, oops, not that next, but before we start the video, my response was, um, you know, researchers are, farmers are researchers. Farmers were the first researchers. They domesticated most of our crops, have come up with you know, a lot of what agroecology is and its practices. And so what the videos have done, it helped farmers see themselves that way and empowered farmers not just to look for expertise outside, but to, to reconnect with themselves as researchers. And this is a clip from one of the access agriculture videos that I like, because the farmer talks about experimentation and sort of talking to the camera and asking his fellow farmers to experiment with, with what, they're, what they're talking about in the video. Okay, please play the video. To my fellow farmers from different places, I recommend that you first plant like an experiment, so you can see the results. Because when you do not see the results, you may be unsure about planting cultivated fodder. This next little clip is from um, a farmer that my colleague uh, uh, just did a quick little video of who have participated in access agriculture videos and has also watched them. And he also talks about the scaling deep of valuing his language when we talk about transdisciplinary or plur pluridisciplinary, different kinds of knowledge and empowering him to think of his knowledge as valuable and something to be shared can be very profound. Go ahead. Domicilio fue una bonita experiencia ya que tuve la oportunidad de compartir algunos conocimientos de lo que se hace aquí en, la, en, en mi localidad y, y tener la oportunidad, o sea, y otra experiencia más hermosa de tener la oportunidad que esto se difunda en otras, en otras partes del mundo para que sepan nuestra forma de trabajar aquí la agricultura, entonces me pareció una excelente oportunidad de compartir mis pequeños conocimientos. And finally, I have a little clip again of another farmer talking about this idea of scaling out or sort of horizontal 
how farmers, farmer to farmer, and other stakeholders talk to each other and can sort of start to think about grassroots or collective action. And it's not that everyone needs to see the video. Farmers talk to their family members, their neighbors, and it starts a conversation that can, can lead to sort of collective action. Go ahead. Hablar de eso porque, por ejemplo, hemos aprendido en el grupo, en los talleres, y luego yo les he transmitido a mi familia, he transmitido que eso es bueno, y no es, no es difícil ni costoso tampoco, entonces eh, nos ha servido de mucho ese. Eh, compartir y eh, mediante los talleres hemos aprendido, hemos practicado y sí hemos notado la diferencia, sí ha servido de mucho en nuestra comunidad. Great, and next, please. And then lastly, scaling up, which is the idea of sort of influencing policy. Um, I like these videos. I recut them often like I just did to bring farmer voice into the conversation we're having right now, bring it into different places without, you know, necessarily having to fly farmers all over the place, but really get their voice there. And so we've, in the Andean countries where I work, it's also used in policy uh, uh, circles and with consumers, maybe not the whole video, but cutting sort of certain parts where they really talk about uh, different issues. Next. I'm not gonna, don't worry, I'm not gonna discuss this whole thing. It's the theory of change that we use in the Andes, but this diagram in the middle often speaks to audiences like I think are on the phone right now of people who work in international and local spaces and really thinking about how we connect local and global. You know, locally, global, Global things affect local context, right? Like climate change, like multinationals. And then likewise, local learning needs to be shared at a global level. And I think access agriculture um, has a lot of interesting ways of doing that. And my last slide is, um, is a video of Sonia Laura, who's here in Bolivia, who um, is a technician who works as a, you know, kind of facilitator in, in NGOs talking about this global local connection. Go ahead. Era interesante ver en un en un idioma local eh, representaciones eh, de otros de contextos globales, ¿no? Eh, y de otras culturas principalmente, otras formas de vestir, otras formas de trabajar. Pero lo interesante es que tenían un mismo enfoque, ¿no? Hablar de eh, cuidar la tierra, cuidar el agua cuidar la semilla, eh, elaborar productos orgánicos, eso, eso eh, definitivamente en, en un contexto ya más global nos hace pues eh, ubicarnos en que estamos en un solo espacio territorial, no es de la tierra, no hay otro, no hay otro espacio y eh, que solo son idiomas, solo son formas de vestirnos, solo son espacios, momentos tal vez en que estamos distantes. ¿no? Entonces eh, se rompe ese, esos, esos, um, esas brechas territoriales, espaciales, cuando uno ve de otra cultura hablando del mismo problema de plagas, del, del mismo problema del cambio climático. Entonces eh, con los videos, con el idioma, que es lo más importante, eh, las personas de, de, de una comunidad, por ejemplo, Aymara, viendo a unas eh, personas de la comunidad afro, de, de, de África, hablando de lo mismo, trabajando en lo mismo. Entonces, eh, creo que se rompe, ayuda a romper esas barreras, eh, principalmente espaciales. ¿no? Thank you. That's it. Back to you, blessings. Thank you very much, Claire, uh, for sharing your valuable experience. It is indeed interesting to learn how the videos are helping rural communities to discover various farming techniques and methods which are more productive, sustainable, and also more importantly, ecological. Please join me in thanking our distinguished speakers for their presentations today. Uh, there's some great interaction going on in the chat uh, and also in the Q&A chat, and we'll be getting the presenters and panelists to respond to those questions in the Q&A segment, so you can continue to type your questions uh, in the Q&A box. Now we move on to the next exciting part of the webinar, which is a panel discussion, and my colleague, Phil Malone, who is the communications specialist at Access Agriculture, who facilitate this discussion with a fabulous group of panelists. Phil, over to you. Thank you so much, Blessings. So we've had 
the main presentations from the speakers. Now it's time for the fast fire round because we've got seven superstars who are going to join us from different parts of the world who are going to talk about their experience and how they have interacted with different farmers where they are based. Um, I think I will just see on the screen many, many people and faces coming up. Let me just quickly introduce you to them. There's Carolina Maturana, who is the regional consultant for Latin America and the Caribbean for the FAO Family Farming Knowledge Platform, and we'll find out about that in just a minute. Chris Weichhaus, who is the CEO of Chrysalis Consulting, he's been doing a lot of work with nature-based solutions for plant health in Vietnam. Nitya Gotcha, who's Director of Anthra Livestock Development and Ethno Veterinary Group in India, finding out how she's been working with people and their animals. Simon Matonga, who's based at Edgerton University in Kenya. He is an agricultural extension and education specialist. Find out from him how that has helped him with his outreach work. Hanuma Prasad Kaliagota is from my sort of person because he's involved with radio where the pictures are always much better. He's involved with Radio Vishnu in Andhra Pradesh, so he'll be talking about his work in the Telugu language. And Madalitsu Mvula is head of programs at a TV station in Malawi called Zodiac TV. And last but not least, because he's smiling there for everybody, is Jacob Wanyama, who is Eastern and Southern Africa coordinator for promoting local innovation, or as many of you know it, ProLinova. So Carolina, welcome. Tell me a little bit about, we've just had the start of the decade for family farming, and you have realized that after the year of family farming, it was worthwhile trying to do something to try and spread the good news. How did you do that? Thank you, Phil, for the introduction. And thank you, of course, for the invitation. I, I want to start explaining what is the Family Farming Knowledge Platform. It's a global and digital repository created as a main legacy of the International Year of Family Farming. The platform is intended for a wide range of users, from government officers to farmer organizations, from academia to civil society association and non-governmental organization. Therefore, it's in a prime position to contribute to the United Nations Decade on Family Farming. 2019-2078. Currently, we have more than uh, 13 contents, 238 contributors worldwide, and around uh, 70,000 users per month. During this year, uh, we create different tools. The platform, uh, for example, includes 11 thematic pages to group its content. One of them is agroecology, in which we have around 2,500 among publication, manual, e-learning, and of course, we have from Access Agriculture almost 500 videos. In addition, we create also a network uh, for helping connect family farming key players from the same countries or region, encouraging them to explore areas common interest that, that may serve as a basis to establish partnership and collaboration among its members. Presently, we have uh, 70 hundred in, uh, entities. So First, you've got these communities of practice in the different yes. places. Tell me a little bit about how you've been interacting in Latin America. How has that worked? In Latin America, we have an, an open platform with moderate management. It's an initiative promoted for by FAO. We are there, and of course, with partners like uh, Agroecology uh, Knowledge uh, Hub, and Claxo is the Latin America Council of Social Science. Uh, another red, uh, network is the Public Policy Network and Rural Development in Latin America. Red Cial is the, a network in Brazil. And of course, uh, there is uh, SOCLA, the Latin American Scientific Society of Agroecology. With these partners, uh, we create something like a, a capacity development program in order to generate an open um, and practical dialogue aimed at solving the specific needs of uh, small farmers and producers, bringing knowledge and successful experience that contribute to the debate in the face of some challenge. 
agroecological uh, transformation technologies and access to markets resilience and climate change so that whole farmer to farmer approach really works with that fao platform it's good to see that the it could linkage there chris uh, you're based uh, in vietnam with a lot of your experience tell me how you have worked with farmers there and how have they learned from each other yeah th thank you phil um so first of all happy anniversary to access for access agriculture for the uh, 10 years of ex excellent work um yeah so we, i have worked um together with paul and together with the access agriculture team over the past couple of years in developing a number of training videos on biological control so on on the use of good insects to to combat uh, agricultural pests and for me the videos really have made a difference on three different fronts um, so first of all uh, farmer to farmer educational video it has filled critical gaps in farmers agroecological knowledge because most farmers they have no clue about beneficial insects except maybe for pollinators such as honeybees for the majority of farmers the only good bug is a dead bug um, they don't know predators, they have no idea what parasitoids are, they don't know entomopathogens, and as a consequence, many farmers, they undervalue the contribution of biological control and often revert to chemicals for crop protection. So that's the first element. A second element is that educational video, it has really made the invisible visible. Yeah, the handful of farmers that do know about biological control, they are familiar with the active, large bodied and charismatic organisms, yeah? ground beetles, mm -hmm. predatory wasps, ladybugs, but organisms that are less conspicuous, um, organisms that work at night or, or that have complex uh, life histories, uh, such as parasitic wasps or, or, or uh, microscopic fun fungi, they are unknown. So the video really has let farmers discover those creatures. So and if I third... gave you a wish list of maybe some other videos you might like for the future, what ones would you suggest then, Chris? Oh, um, yeah, uh, may maybe videos, well, definitely videos that trigger farmers' experimentation and innovation. I think that's very important because uh, as a, as a uh, other people already indicated farmers are really born experimenters yeah, yeah? but they, they cannot use what they or they cannot um, uh, they cannot use what they do not know so we have to provide them pieces of information um, another good um, video could be videos that uh, are are geared towards rural entrepreneurs um, for the development of cottage style production units of quality um, pure strain na natural enemies yeah how can how can rural entrepreneurs develop trichogramma fungi how can they they pr produce egg par parasitoids that that could be very good as well and then maybe a third a third one could be videos that uh, promote the intercontinental transfer of knowledge between uh, areas of origin, region of origin of an invasive pest and the, the, the regions where that pest has, has, uh, has established. For example, Brilliant. I'm thinking about Palarmi worm yeah, between Latin America, where it, it's originally from, and Africa and Asia, where it has invaded. Yeah. That good South South communication that is brilliant because that then brings us to Nitya. I had the pleasure of meeting Nitya maybe three weeks ago when she was taking part in a conference in Ireland, um, and she's been making videos in India, which have now been shown in Africa and Latin America in local languages. Nitya, farmers sometimes think the vet is a little bit like God. How do you change that so that farmers understand what they can do to help their own animals? Yeah, so first of all, uh, Phil, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel and congratulations on completing 10 years to you, Paul and Phil and the others in the Access Agriculture team. Okay, so farmers considering the, uh, the videos as God, 
uh, in some parts of the world, I guess, all communication comes from God. But here, actually, some of our videos have been looking at how farmers help themselves. The way that we made the videos with Access Agriculture, the scripts, the way they were written is actually using farmers' own knowledge of how they would deal with a particular problem, such as we've made videos on fever, just simple problem, like fever, diarrhea, foot rot, and how they could then deal with a problem using local remedies, using locally available resources, using, you know, get uh, tools and implements which are available around the house, and then making it that much simpler for them to be able to uh, uh, address a situation which could have otherwise blown out of shape. So I would say the focus of our uh, videos have been that, making farmers being able to deal with the situation and then also giving them a message at the end that if it doesn't happen, you may need to consult a, doc, a, vet, a veterinarian, but giving also a little bit of uh, support in the hands of farmer themselves, farmers themselves. But you've been very good at doing the method in a way which is easy to follow step by step for the farmer. How difficult is that? Because most professors I know, uh, they like using all these Latin names and things. <laughs> I'm not a professor, firstly. Been working on this for years. So for, the first thing we did actually was write books. And when we wrote the books for farmers, we had to make it very simple. So I've been doing this for actually close to 25 years. But the books you see we that we wrote, even in local languages, couldn't be read because if the, the, the truth is some a lot of people in India, especially women, who take care of our sick animals can't read. I mean, it's unfortunate that that was the situation we found ourselves in. Even today, there are eight ladies, women who are about 45 or 50 who can't read. So then the movies, when we were introduced to Access Agriculture, it actually came as this, hey, <laughs> aha moment when we could say, here's a platform we, which we can collaborate with and the books that we've written can be translated into workable movies. And I think a lot of support has come from the Access Agriculture team helping us write those. I mean, it's it's been a collaborative effort working with the team and it's been a real pleasure doing it also. Working Thank you so much, Nitya. Somebody else who's also been doing that type of outreach work is Simon, based at Edgerton University. You have seen yourself, some of your colleagues, they don't understand why you're trying to speak the local languages with these videos and getting your students to go out to the farmers. If you could just unmute yourself, Simon, can we hear from you how you have done this work and change the attitudes of people at your university by using video? Thank you, Phil. Um, my name is Simon uh, from Egerton University, Kenya, and I teach uh, communication technology. And uh, since uh, the time I started working with Access Agriculture, uh, it has uh, helped me a lot um, interacting with the students and uh, my colleagues on um, development of uh, video, farmer, farmer to farmer videos in the language that um, uh, they can understand. I've taken opportunities, one time allows me to talk to my colleagues and tell them that um, the information they develop from their thesis or dissertations, and that information or that innovation is useless unless it is, it is uh, converted into a language farmers uh, who are consumers of that innovation can understand. So uh, by and large, about uh, it's about 10 years or so, I've uh, been working with the Access Agriculture and I've been able to train uh, students and uh, people in workshops and seminars on how uh, to uh, uh, to use uh, popular technical writing, such that uh, the language they use in uh, writing fact sheets or scripts, all our video production that is uh, presented in a way uh, a farmer uh, can uh, understand and use. And but you work a lot the... with extension people. Do they see the videos as a threat or do they see it as something useful? Thank you. The, those uh, they have worked with the extension workers, especially around the, the, the university, and they are very, very encouraged with those videos. In fact, uh, I've, uh, they have sourced uh, for videos from me. I've also guided them on where to get them uh, so that they can uh, use it uh, with the farmers. They are very happy with them. They know these videos are not uh, working against them. They are working to complement their work so that when they, they work, like, for example, a video on um, on uh, controlling uh, fallout armyworms. They are able to 
um, share with the farmers and the farmers can use those videos uh, at home uh, and, and uh, help the farmer are the extension worker there are very few uh, fillers you know uh, in the in in Kenya and they are aging so they are not able to reach all the farmers at, at the time they are needed so sharing those videos uh, uh, help them Great. Okay, Sam, I think we've just lost you there, but we got the main message. Uh, Hanuma Prasad, you're working with Community Radio Vishnu. Tell me how you have been able to use the soundtracks to help the farmers in your part of the world in Andhra Pradesh, please. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and I congratulate each and every one of the Access Agricultural team. And you guys have successfully completed 10 years. And uh, actually, I'm very fortunate to associate it with uh, access agriculture. And actually, since one year, uh, we are, uh, I think last, last year, we found this, uh, we got one email from access agriculture. So from then, uh, we actually, we created an account and uh, I saw all the videos and all. So then uh, actually, uh, since it's a community radio station uh, and we need to check uh, uh, those audios, videos, whatever, because since uh, we will be having some rules and regulations uh, under like Ministry of Information Broadcasting, whether this is a verified news or not, whether this is appropriate or not, something like that. So then immediately what uh, I did was, so I collected all the audios, I downloaded all the audios. Like at present we have 87 uh, videos in Telugu language. Okay. And uh, so then I downloaded all the audios and videos as well. So we have a, uh, agricultural department, it's called the Krishi Vignana Kendra. So actually the scientists will be there, so all the people will be there. So uh, I went there and I asked them, is it okay to broadcast or not? So can you let me know? And uh, we know that frequently the scientists will come over here and they will give a talk on seasonal crops and everything. So they said they went through all the videos and audios and they said that okay, it's fine to broadcast and you can go ahead. Then we started uh, uh, broadcasting. Actually, uh, by the time we don't have any special program for the farmers. And after that, we designed specially one program. And uh, at present, we are uh, broadcasting access agricultural uh, uh, audios. And uh, we downloaded all the audios and uh, every day. It's a 365 as the program. And actually, the only uh, one thing uh, is only uh, since we have only 87 audios, and I think uh, previously I spoke to Mr. Upadhyay and uh, uh, some other person, Mr. Ahmad or somebody else. Uh, Mr. Ahmad, but I don't know the my name, but exactly. And uh, so the same thing uh, I would like to discuss uh, with Mr. Raman and Ms. Savitri as well. Actually, I wanted to create more and more uh, audios from our radio station. And they actually, uh, since this is an educational institution, we have uh, 12,000 uh, students in our, like we have different, different colleges, two engineering colleges, and one dental college, one pharmacy college. And like that, we have uh, uh, seven institutions in one campus and they have uh, different clubs and like uh, 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 organic farming club, we have Brilliant. Save Farmer Club and Save Earth Club. So actually we downloaded all these videos and whenever they have uh, uh, the, every week they'll be having that uh, meetings. Uh, the club meetings so they are projecting all these videos so the main so, thing we need to do is to look and see is there a way in future we can get more videos in the telugu language so you have more material talking uh, about television in malawi they have a tv station called zodiac and madalitsu mavula is there using our videos but it's being used not just by people in rural areas but some of your viewers are in the towns as well madalitsu if you come off the mute we can hear from you yeah. The, Which well, language we, is it? Chichewa? Uh, we, we use both English and Chichewa now. Yes. So uh, thank you, Phil. Um, in Malawi for the past uh, five, six, a uh, couple of years, we've seen a shift um, in, in, in knowledge and approach. At first, agriculture was uh, uh, viewed as uh, a rural-based uh, activity. It wasn't a, a thing for the towns, for the urban dwellers. But now, I think for the past five years, it's now it's being adopted by people from the urban areas. People are, dropping, are actually dropping their white collar jobs and adopting agriculture, uh, farming as a full time job. So what has happened is um, with these, these videos, uh, they on TV, 
we say maybe TV is for the urban dwellers. Now, the programs from Access Agriculture have come at a time when uh, the audience needed the most. So it's been at, uh, it's given the uh, the new farmers, the those who are dropping their white collar jobs uh, to adopt farming, uh, a platform to learn. Uh, like it was said earlier from the videos that we, the sample videos that we, we, we've seen, uh, it's more of a farmer to farmer uh, uh, approach. It's like they are hearing from somebody who is practicing that and it's more of uh, if it has worked in India, it has worked in the Philippines, it has worked in Brazil, it's even working, let's say, in East Africa. That means I have the evidence it will work here because um, the, the, the problem is they wouldn't take um, information from somebody wearing a tie, a suit, somebody uh, t with, with technical details. They would rather want to hear from someone with basic experience in the field. So this has helped a, uh, a lot. And uh, apart from that, I would say the, the war in Ukraine, in, in, uh, in, in Russia, has created a, such a a kind of a gap that fertilizer prices have literally skyrocketed. I think uh, by maybe 70, 50%, the prices have jumped just in the past one, one year uh, alone. So the program that we put on TV has assisted our farmers to adopt new ways, uh, sustainable ways of uh, uh, farming. Uh, for cheap. Brilliant. Yes. Good. Thank you so much. So obviously, the farmer to farmer videos are good quality for a TV station like you, but also at Prodenova, Jacob, you have had your own programs you've made yourselves, which might not be the professional level, but you've been able to use our sister platform called EcoAgTube. Explain how you've been able to use that and have your own project pages, please, sir. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I would like to again, like other speakers, to congratulate. Uh, Access Agriculture for the 10th anniversary. Um, I also want to thank uh, Access Agriculture for allowing uh, our videos to be hosted on the uh, Echo Acre tube and, and actually even providing some advice on how to make some uh, some of these videos in a simple way. Uh, I will start by saying Pronova is an international network. And sometimes we call it community of practice. And the, main interest of this network is to promote local innovation processes, local innovation processes in agroecology and uh, natural resource. And, and so um, we recognize that they, we, based on the fact that we have dynamics in indigenous knowledge and uh, this dynamics in indigenous knowledge creates, makes, uh, provide the, uh, the basis for farmers to try and find uh, solutions of the problems they face. Maybe using maybe natural resources and things like that. And the way we do it is that we have pl platforms uh, at country level. We have country platforms which has membership of stakeholders, mild stakeholders. We have universities, uh, NGOs. Uh, we have even private sector membership. The purpose is they bring in different skills that will support farmers who are trying to come up with solutions locally. One and, of the main uh, reasons why you've used EcoAgTube, I believe, Jacob, is that so, even when the project yeah, the main ends, reason is, uh, you still yeah, have the that, videos, yeah? Yeah, is that uh, we, when we do this, uh, we need to share this, we need one, two things, two things we really want to come out of this, that the whole idea of uh, promoting farmer innovation first is to change their lives, but also to try and change the way things are done uh, in terms of uh, government institutions, they, they most of them, if you know, they don't recognize local innovations, or if they do, they only go there to pick it and uh, make it. So we want to change the, the game. And to do that, we need to switch more people. Uh, we have our own website, which has videos, and some of them have been there for years. We have all, over 3,000, I may say 2,000 or so. And, and so our idea was to try and make a, a, a new reach and actually focus on those who have interest in agroecology. And agroecology is the subject of this uh, website uh, that is run by Access Agriculture. So we can put these videos everywhere. I mean, we can put in the YouTubes, we have them in YouTubes. 
but we were capturing, we know people visit this say website with that specific interest. Now, we, want to, we wanted to put a message through that because uh, our way of doing things, a lot of us, we have talked about training videos and, 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 and we will look at the training videos as a means to influence or, or a means to change the process. So we are more focused on the process. And, and, and so we provide these videos through, the, we, we got interested in using this website because we can now bring the message of uh, which deals with the best. And if you want yeah. to see those videos, they are there on Eco AgTube. You've done brilliantly, all seven of you. I really appreciate it. I know it was very tight on time, but we do have to get the questions and answers together with the other panelists. So please hang around and see if some of the questions are for you. Blessings, I think you've got about uh, 12 minutes left and uh, then we'll do a wrap up after that. But thank you so much. Thank you very much, Phil, for, for moderating that panel discussion. Obviously, we're running a little bit tight on the time, uh, so I'd like to quickly move to the next segment, which is the Q&A session. Uh, we have some interesting questions coming on the chat, so I'll be uh, highlighting some of those questions and just quickly directing them to the panelists and the presenters. Our first question goes to, to Josephine. Um, it says, you are aware that there's a great digital divide in many developing countries. Uh, can rural youth afford ICT tools to be able to promote the videos on agroecology? Uh, well, that's a difficult one. Um, I think a lot is happening and the cost is coming down. Um, there has been talk for a long time about low Earth orbit satellites um, that would be able to, to carry uh, data at low costs and to extend out from cities and towns into the really into the rural areas. So it is coming, but it's taking much longer than people expect. Um, young people tend to be the ones that really want to, uh, to, to get onto the internet. Um, so if they have any opportunity, then yes, they will do that, and I'm sure they will. Um, but the cost, and particularly in Africa, cost is a major factor. So um, we're doing our best to try and get on to, to free sites so that people can access it cheaply. But yeah, it, it, it's a challenge. It definitely is a challenge. All right. Um, uh, Leonard Tawakali has asked a question that a number of people have asked as well on the chat, and that is how can organizations work with access agriculture in the work that you do? Is that for me or for Paul? Just been, yeah. Okay. If I move on to Paul, thank you. Okay. I mean, the first thing is um, register on the platform. Um, you know, that's the first thing. Um, if the uh, young entrepreneurs is, is of interest, then obviously please keep an eye out for the calls we put out. Uh, that is dependent on funding. The calls go out in different countries depending on the funding that's available. Um, but yeah, get in, get in contact, um, you know, also look on Eco AgTube um, and just, yes, get in touch. I'm sure Paul would be delighted to talk with you as well. <laughs> Maybe Great, uh, have a comment. Just to add, like, Paul, like we, are, we are very much a value adding organization. So any organization who is developing projects that have a farmer training component or capacity building around agroecology, we would be very pleased to, to work with you to help you develop proposals and be part of, of exciting new partnerships. Great, thank you very much for, for that addition, Paul. And because you, you are on the floor, let me direct this next question to you. Um, do you think that it is important to combine video and farmer field school approaches in scaling agroecology? Well, I think I think that's a very good question, and and my my answer is definitely yes. Um, we we know from farmer field schools that one of one of the challenges is is to keep um, the interest of the participants over over season and to attend weekly sessions. Time is costly for farmers. And, and often the facilitators, they, they are really keen to use the videos to make, to, to, to diversify their training formats and to keep the training attractive to farmers. Um, obviously, farmer field schools, they are, they are known to, to focus a lot on discovery-based learning. And as, as Chris explained 
um, making the visible, uh, making the invisible visible. And so there also videos can can help a lot in, in helping farmers to understand some of the underlying scientific principles on the things they observe in their ecosystem. Great. Uh, thank you very much for, for that response, Paul. Um, I'll move on quickly to the next question, and this will be directed to Claire. Um, do you think that uh, the use of farmer to farmer videos has changed the dynamics of interaction between researchers and farmers? Do we still have Claire Sorry. on? Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. I do think it has. Um, yeah, for the reasons I, it, it both values farmer knowledge to farmers and to researchers and, and making researchers really aware of their users and making sure that the research is applied and, and having that, again, that kind of peer review or check, I think researchers appreciate. Great, thank you very much uh, for that, Claire. Um, there's a comment as well on someone asking on how they'll get in touch um, with the CCRP. Please, uh, if you'd be able to share contact details with us, then they'll, they'll be able to get in touch and maybe take further discussions forward. There was a question that was asked to, to Dr. Emmy. I'll just, I'm just gonna read it because he provided a response. I know he's not, has dropped off of, off of the call, but it was a really interesting question from Hosea who wanted to know more on the financing and investment section uh, for the coalition. How do stakeholders ensure that there's effective financing for agroecology and agroecological enterprises? And he further asked if there are any working models to learn from, um, or that would inspire uh, other organizations to learn from them. And Dr. Emil's response was that there's a methodology to evaluate how agroecological project proposals are written. Um, that can also be used for portfolio analysis and to see what proportion of investments are focused on agroecology, but can also be used for project design. I really just wanted to bring this question in. Um, I am looking at the time and I realize we'd um, spend the whole afternoon taking questions. So unfortunately, I'd have to curtail uh, this part of our program here and pass on to Phil for the closeout. Phil, over to you. Blessings, thank you so much. So the main thing is, let us just reflect upon what we have learned in the last 90 minutes. Uh, the first thing is that thanks to the great work of our interpreters, we've been able to hear this in Spanish and in French. So a very big thank you to Worldly Wise for helping us with the technicals and with making sure everything worked on the interpretation side. Also, big thanks to the behind the scenes work of the Access Agriculture team, because without them, we wouldn't be able to be heard, would we? And the other thing is now, let's just have a listen to some of the things that might inspire us as we look back at the last 10 years of the achievements of the farmers who have benefited from the knowledge of other farmers, facilitated by being able to see videos which are very practical in the local languages. As Josephine said, coming up to a hundred languages now. Emil started by congratulating us for the 10 years. He spoke about the Agroecology Coalition and about how we need to really get this moving to scale. He talked about communication and he also talked about action. If we can do that, communicate and bring the voice of the farmers. I think that was something that was um, mentioned uh, by uh, Claire and how she brought that in in her part. Josephine talked about quality videos and about local languages. Paul spoke about entrepreneurs, how we work with young people, how importantly we work with women. As Nietzsche said, those women may not have had the opportunity to be able to read as others do. So video is a great way. I think we heard from somebody in Uganda one time who said, when it's in my language, I can take ownership. We know that with COVID, with the big problems that have been with the cost of inputs going up, especially artificial fertilizers, farmers are looking for ways of making a profit and caring for the environment and improving what is there both for themselves and for future generations. So we really need to help those farmers understand and learn from other farmers. As Paul said, 
We've reached now 90 million people. It's all about, as Mac Knight would show, all about community and all about learning, helping to share. And I think, as we know, there are many, many issues. The climate is changing. There are pockets of hunger across many of the continents where we are working. We want to find ways of helping people to overcome problems. I heard a great story just two or three weeks ago of somebody who was in Somalia and one of our videos they had managed to see all about drip irrigation of tomato. And this was in an area which was almost like desert. But because it wasn't in the Somali language, somebody who is a local extension officer just translated the video from English to the local language. And they were able to follow step by step. And when this person visited, they were growing tomatoes, nice and bright and red, with nothing but brown, yellow desert all around. And because these were out of season tomatoes, they were worth five times the normal price. So farmers can learn from other farmers about ways of improving things for themselves and for their communities. As we look forward to the next 10 years, everything we do is based upon partnerships. You saw the panel, all of those people are our partners. So we want to increase that partnership and increase our effectiveness because farmers in the countries where we work deserve better. They may not have had a voice in the past. In this decade of family farming and the year of indigenous languages, they deserve to be heard and they deserve to show others how they can improve things for their communities. I hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Please keep in touch and the recording will be available afterwards. And a very big thank you to everyone for helping this come together. Those are some of the emails if you want to go, uh, the web addresses, accessagriculture.org, ecoagtube.org, and agro-coalition.org, agroecology-coalition.org. Thank you so much. The Smart Projector, improving the soil and improving lives. Bye. Thank you.